On this Friday night, no deal for now. NAFTA negotiations are on hold with no agreement reached. They're taking the long weekend to regroup and maybe even cool off. Christia Freeland says a good deal is still very much in sight. But did Donald Trump's off-the-record comments about Canada sour today's talks? Also tonight, anger in Alberta. The wait for the Trans Mountain Pipeline gets longer while patience wears thin. Plus, could a new player in Canada's e-cigarette market completely change the game? A vape pod with the same nicotine as a pack of cigarettes, not just for adults, apparently. This is The National. If a NAFTA deal is reached, and that is still an if at this stage, it may be in spite of the U.S. president and not because of him. The talks aren't over, but they have been paused now until Wednesday. As Katie Simpson tells us, Donald Trump's off-the-record musings certainly weren't helping momentum. You will only agree to a deal that is a good deal for Canada. We're not there yet. Donald Trump had threatened to cut Canada out of NAFTA if the Canadians didn't sign on to a new deal by today. But that hasn't happened. Instead, the president sent a letter to Congress saying when the talks finally wrap up, he's ready to approve a new pact with Mexico and with Canada if it is willing. The president was 600 kilometers from the negotiating table, but his presence loomed over the discussions. Trump had to defend himself after comments he made about Canada off the record ended up being published. I made a statement about Canada, which is fine, because I love Canada. But they've taken advantage of our country for many years. Trump said he would not make any NAFTA concessions to Canada, adding if he said that publicly, Canada would be too insulted to sign a deal. But I said, in the end, it's OK, because at least Canada knows how I feel. So it's fine. It's fine. Canadian negotiators confronted the U.S. about the comments, but later said that Trump's views were not being mirrored at the table. Ambassador Lighthizer and his team have been negotiating in good faith and with goodwill. That goodwill is going to be tested when negotiators sit down again next week. The U.S. is pushing for Canada to allow farmers to sell more dairy products north of the border, while Canada is refusing to back down on demands the U.S. drop its request to kill the dispute resolution system. We have been very clear about where uh, our red lines are. We've been very clear about where uh, we think there's room for uh, give and take. Uh, this is something that uh, we take seriously as a renegotiation. We understand how this works. The one thing that everyone agrees on, they're ready for a break. Negotiators tried to cram weeks' worth of work into four days, and they didn't quite get there, Rosie. Okay, so where is Mexico in all this? Do they need to get back to the table at some point, too? The Mexicans were actually spotted at the Canadian embassy for some meetings this afternoon, but they're not expected to actually formally re-enter the negotiations until Canada and the U.S. deal with all of their bilateral issues. Okay, Katie, tools down for you for a little bit anyway. Thank you. This is CBC's Thanks. Katie Simpson in Washington. The U.S. Capitol building, where much will be decided in the coming weeks after U.S. President Donald Trump sent a letter to members stating his intention to eventually ink a deal with Canada. The first big date to watch? This coming Wednesday, September 5th, that's when Canadian and American negotiators go back at it. The letter then says that over the next few weeks, members of Congress and business leaders should be able to have a look at the agreement. It offers no specific dates, though, and if all goes well, Trump intends to sign a trade agreement with Canada and Mexico 90 days from today, which is November 29th. Obviously, there are no guarantees of a deal at all. The Americans seem to be content to keep playing hardball, but Canada, too, has its sticking points. Chapter 19, NAFTA's dispute resolving mechanism. It allows countries to work out disagreements through a politically neutral panel. The Americans want to scrap it. Canada is adamant that it stays in some form. And there's the $20 billion dairy sector. Trump wants Ottawa to remove protections and open it up. But with over 200,000 jobs on the line and concerns of cheap American dairy flooding north, Canada is unlikely to budge. And then there's Canada's cultural industry. 
they tend to see uh, cultural matters, as in virtually everything else, as uh, something that has a dollar sign on it. It's never been easy to compete with a giant next door. I was in full support of his proposal of free trade. That's why Canada insisted on and won some key cultural exemptions during free trade talks back in 1987, like content quotas, government subsidies, and strict rules on foreign ownership. They automatically carried over into NAFTA, and they've worked well and helped launch successful careers. But as politics and technology change, are those exemptions in danger? Jérôme Payette is with the Coalition for the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, a group committed to protecting them. If we uh, go in a digital uh, economy and, and for culture as well, and there's no, not any way to uh, support uh, our actors, our creators, our producers, our publishers, uh, they will be in serious trouble because, of course, the USA has, uh, is a powerhouse uh, regarding culture. So they create a lot, very good content that uh, we cannot compete without any government support. Just yeah. another yeah. sticking point for Canadian negotiators to keep in mind before talks resume uh, next week. That's about where she is. You want to We're at the end of what has surely been one of the most challenging weeks of Justin Trudeau's government between NAFTA and the pipeline. The host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, joins me now. Vashi, I know you've been talking to people, reaching out to people in government. Give us a sense, a sense of how they're feeling tonight. Well, hi, Rosie. There are there are a lot of concerns on the part of people I've been speaking to in, in government, not just about uh, NAFTA, but especially about the pipeline file. That decision was a big blow to the mantra that they really got elected on and that we've heard so many times from Justin Trudeau, this idea that the environment can be protected while the economy can grow at the same time. And this court decision really provides the biggest test of that almost campaign slogan that we've heard over and over and over again. And people in government are concerned that, that te they will fail that test. On the NAFTA file, I mean, there is, uh, is some sort of mitigated optimism, I guess you could say, or cautious optimism. They, they are—it's not the worst-case scenario, for sure. Things didn't fall apart. But it's also not the best-case scenario. They didn't get a deal. And they're worried. Sources are, I've spoken to are worried about how far apart they are on some of the major sticking points. OK. So what's the plan to move forward if there is one? Yeah, it's a difficult one. On, on NAFTA, even if they do get the best-case scenario and there's a deal, they have to try and sell whatever concessions they make domestically, and that won't be easy. Mm -hmm. On the pipeline file, they have to figure out, are they going to appeal it, or are they going to start consultations all over again? And sources I said, they feel like they almost have handed the opposition a gift two weeks out from Parliament resuming and, you know, a, and a year out from an election. Okay. Vashti, thanks for this tonight. appreciate it. No problem. Now, the Prime Minister was asked about that pipeline project today, and he repeated that Canada's changing relationship with the United States makes it more important than ever. I think uh, with everything that's been going on, people can kind of understand that having only the United States as a market for 99% of our oil resources simply doesn't make sense anymore. And that's why uh, we've always believed that the, we believe that the Trans uh, uh, Mountain Pipeline expansion is in the best interest uh, of all Canadians. So, Trudeau is obviously sticking to the, the same message, the government message there. But despite yesterday's court decision putting the pipeline in legal limbo, how is it all going over with Canadians, particularly those who live and work in the oil patch? Carolyn Dunn has some of their reaction. Check out your latest purchase, Canadians. As of today, you own this terminal and a list of Trans Mountain Pipeline assets. Of course, construction is halted now, and the whole situation has many Albertans feeling betrayed. I felt like promises were kind of let go. It was, uh, it was just a big blow. At the Ironworkers Local 720, Ottawa is the main target of their resentment. A lot of our members are feeling some anger towards the federal government, thinking that maybe they could do more. Um, it's, it, it, to me, it's disappointment, a little bit of anger, and I think fear as well. A similar sentiment from the soaring office towers in Calgary's oil and gas driven downtown. I think it's very embarrassing for Canada that our federal government has spent four and a half billion dollars on this and now it, uh, we're an embarrassment to the world on this. Alberta's premier who banked her political reputation on getting the pipeline built says pulling out of the federal climate change plan is the most effective ammunition. 
But Notley is the target of anger from provincial opposition leader Jason Kenney. He says she should be demanding everything from renegotiating equalization to withdrawing funding to BC for things like job training and infrastructure. So if the Premier was really serious about asserting Alberta's interests, it, it, uh, there's, a, there's a long list of, of real action that she could take. British Columbia doesn't escape the finger pointing either. This, to me, just smacks of Pacific privilege. This smacks of Burnaby arrogance, uh, and that concerns me. There's a broader context to this, and, and that is that, uh, that the oil supply that Alberta provides really is in the national interest. So what's next? Well, the Premier's office tells us Trudeau listened to Notley yesterday, but Ottawa has yet to make any commitments about its way forward. And that leaves many Albertans headed into this Labor Day weekend worried, wondering what's to come. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. So after addressing her province last night, what does Rachel Notley, the Premier of Alberta, think today? I spoke with her earlier. Premier, good to see you. Were you wrong to believe the federal government when it said it could get this pipeline built? Um, you know, I think that uh, none of us expected the Federal Court of Appeal to make uh, the findings that it did. Um, you know, and I still believe that we can get this pipeline built. But what I do believe is that we're at the point now that the federal government is going to have to use uh, its legislative authority uh, to make sure it happens in a timely and reasonable way. And uh, so that's what we are asking for. Uh, you know, taking action to fight climate change is fundamentally important. Important. But we've always said that it has to go hand in hand with ensuring economic strength and prosperity and, uh, and creating jobs. And that's why we need to get this pipeline built. We uh, need to get a fair return for the resources that we have here in Alberta, uh, which make up such a significant portion of our Canadian economy. And, uh, and uh, with that, we can afford to move forward on climate change, but not without. You've said that you are going to leave the federal carbon pricing plan if it's not done. The prime minister said again today he's going to impose the federal plan for provinces who don't sign on, which means that Alberta gets no say in how the revenue is used, no credit for doing it. How is that a good thing for your province? The additional actions that the federal government wants to take that we agree with uh, to combat climate change, they have to work. I mean, theoretically, you could have a 200-ton uh, 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 charge for carbon, but it wouldn't work because the economy would fail. And our position all along has been that moving to the additional prices that the federal government wants to uh, won't work if we don't make significant progress on strengthening our economic framework and our economic foundations, particularly in Alberta, which is, of course, the biggest emitter in the country. And that's what the pipeline was about. So at the end of the day, I mean, I suppose they can impose it. But what we are saying very strongly is that it won't work unless we get the pipeline and they're going to have a big fight over it. And quite frankly, that's not the position that we want to be in. Wouldn't the fastest way to get the pipeline built, though, be to simply respond to the federal court, to take some of the suggestions the court has made, implement them and go get the pipeline going instead of appealing to the Supreme Court, which which would probably take longer? Uh, well, in fact, the, the difficulty with the way the Federal Court of Appeal outlined what needs to happen is that it effectively appears as though they want us to restart the NAB process. That, uh, and, and with that comes uh, just so many possible areas of more uncertainty and more problems. And that is why we need the federal government to take legislative action. Let me just end on this. Do you think it's going to happen, the, the pipeline? Um, I'm saying that it needs to happen and that it is too stupid for it not to happen. And so it is now time for the federal government to make it happen. Premier Notley, thanks for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. As your kids head back to school, there is a growing trend to tell you about and a controversial new product that's coming to Canada. This is coming to epidemic proportions and it's dangerous. Meredith Berkman is a mom of four, and she's organizing other parents in the U.S. to keep kids from vaping. One of her targets, the biggest player in the game, a company called Juul, and its sleek, discreet gadgets that deliver big hits of nicotine. I know what these teens are doing. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is investigating whether the industry deliberately lures teens into vaping. And it's asked Juul to hand over documents on its marketing strategy. 
Now, amid all that controversy, Juul is coming to Canada in September. It markets itself to adult smokers who want to quit tobacco. And indeed, the way the company portrays its clientele, they're clearly adults. But search Juul on social media and you'll see this. Lots of bright, shiny images of younger people. And as the CBC's Katie Nicholson shows us, while e-cigarettes have been around for a long time, Juul is different. All right, guys, I'm going to take a fatty double Juul hit for you guys. It may look like this guy is sucking on two USB keys, but strength. those are actually the hottest selling vaping pens in the US. This is the Juul, a high dose nicotine vaping system. The Juul looks and feels just like a USB stick. Here you go, you put the flavor pot in, this is the business end, and it doesn't just look like a USB stick, it charges like one too. Snap it into your computer like that. If you're worried about your kids vaping, this is probably your nightmare product. University of Waterloo professor David Hammond studies the public health implications of vaping. This generally has two or three times the nicotine concentration of other e-cigarettes. It's so high, in fact, that they couldn't sell this version in England, where they have limits on the nicotine content. Juul says its products should be kept away from minors, but flavors like mango and fruit medley appeal to the young. You can see why it's, uh, you know, it's more popular among kids. The U.S. Federal Drug Administration is investigating Juul's marketing practices, trying to determine whether it targets teens. Three of my best friends are now addicted to the Juul. And when I say addicted to the Juul, I mean they're using it every hour of every day. Jack Waxman was so disturbed by the effects of the Juul and his fellow students, he started this awareness campaign. I Jeweled pretty much every moment where I wasn't in class. Waxman says kids as young as grade six got hooked on Jeweling at his New York school. If you went to a bathroom in, in any, basically any part of the school, from the first floor to the fourth floor, it was just flooded with groups of kids, both boys and girls, using these devices. Some of my friends have tried using cigarettes, and it's because they have been juuling, because they're so used to juuling, that they just think it's okay to use cigarettes. That's precisely what worries the Canadian Cancer Society, along with lax rules around marketing, especially in Ontario, where e-cigarette legislation was canned by the new Ford government. As kids are going back to school, it'll be legal to vape on high school grounds, and kids will be exposed to promotions and displays in convenience stores near schools. Health Canada says it may introduce more restrictions to keep vape ads away from teens. But for a generation that lives and dies on social media, it may already be too late. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's new regulations on vaping came into effect in May. The products can be legally sold to people 19 and older, but the government says this about their use. Completely replacing cigarette smoking with a vaping product will reduce your exposure to harmful chemicals. However, if you are not a smoker, vaping can increase your exposure to some harmful substances that could negatively affect your health. It's still an open question exactly what the long-term effects of vaping really are. But a small study published earlier this month suggested vaping, with or without nicotine, can increase inflammation and disable key cells that protect a person's airways. Then there's the nicotine in products like Juul. Teens are especially vulnerable to it, says the FDA commissioner. As we know, the nicotine in these products can rewire an adolescent's brain, leading to years of addiction. Lots more we're watching tonight on The National, including yet another blow to Donald Trump's White House. Republican lobbyist Sam Patton pleaded guilty to acting as an unregistered foreign lobbyist. He's admitted to helping a Ukrainian oligarch get tickets to Trump's inauguration. Prosecutors say Patton knew the inauguration committee could not accept money from foreigners. He also acknowledged he lied about the tickets and his foreign lobbying work to the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee. He now faces up to five years in prison, plus a quarter million dollar fine. Today, he lies in the place where he served to the last. And it was Washington's turn to say farewell to Senator John McCain today. His wife, daughter, and 106-year-old mother were there at the U.S. Capitol, along with dozens of lawmakers. Meanwhile, outside the Capitol, hundreds of people waited in line for their turn to say goodbye. Mr. McCain stepped across the line. He found the most combative person 
to make an ally with to get stuff passed. You know, the Republican Party, if they're going to have a future, they're going to need to be have people like John McCain that that uh, you know represent civil rights, human rights, and just a decent decency. McCain's funeral will be held tomorrow at the Washington National Cathedral. Former presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush are expected to speak. Still ahead on The National, the PM's got moves. No, not ours, and it's the British one, and she doesn't really cut a rug very well, but we'll get you caught up on all that in our moment of the day. Also, who has the right to tell Indigenous stories? The question is being posed again over two movies as the Toronto International Film Festival kicks off next week. And we'll take you to the scene in Detroit and the lavish funeral for Aretha Franklin. But first, a look at a group that couldn't be there but still sent some respect. <laughs> Groovy. The band of the Welsh Guards provided today's perfect music for the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. We are right back after this. When you are performing at the funeral for the Queen of Soul, bring on the thunder. That is Fantasia Barino kicking off her heels and singing her heart out. Aretha Franklin was laid to rest today in a way that only she could command, a lavish celebration at a church in Detroit that lasted for hours. Her body arrived in a 1940 Cadillac hearse. Inside that gold casket, she was dressed in a shimmering gold dress, her fourth outfit of the week. And while guests streamed inside, a line of pink Cadillacs rolled outside, a reference to her 1980s hit, Freeway of Love. Organizers insisted this would be a service and not a show, but her final send-off included 18 performers. more than 15 speakers. The secret of her greatness was she took this massive talent and decided to be the composer of her own life song. As a kid, I couldn't understand what it was like to be Aretha Franklin's granddaughter, but now I know what it feels like. It feels amazing to see a woman so fierce, so courageous, gifted, so respected, and to be able to call that my grandmother, to know that I have that running through my blood and that she's a part of who I am, there's nothing like that. Now can we view the mystery of tomorrow? And goes without saying, this was as much about lifting spirits as it was about getting down. Aretha Franklin died earlier this month at the age of 76. Man, if you're going to go, go out in style. Still ahead on The National. Our special CBC short doc. Meet a young woman grappling with a difficult question. What do you do when someone you love commits a shocking crime? It's hard to love someone who has done terrible things, but the terrible things don't undo the love. To still crave connection, to still want them to participate in my life, to still love him. When the Toronto International Film Festival opens next week, four Canadian feature films will arrive with some baggage. All four showcase Indigenous talent, but only two feature it in the director's chair. And that has prompted the question, who has the right to tell Indigenous stories? Tashana Reed explains. Pick it up, guys. Pick it up. An Inuit lacrosse team from the Arctic that beat the odds. 
Not letting her go, okay? A young Cree woman's journey south to search for her missing sister. These are some of the Canadian Indigenous films premiering at the Toronto International Film Festival this year. But of the four Indigenous features, two have white directors. Cree actor Tina Keeper of North of 60 fame starred in Through Black Spruce and helped produce it with non-Indigenous director Don McKellar at the helm. I felt that my role as a producer was as critical as, you know, as a writer or a director on this project. Debate around who gets to tell Indigenous stories has been front and centre. Joseph Boyden, author of the Giller Prize winning novel that inspired the film, faced controversy over his claims of Indigenous roots. You have to learn English. And the film Indian Horse, adapted from a Richard Wagamese novel, raised eyebrows for having a white director and crew. Some filmmakers believe it's high time that only Indigenous directors tell Indigenous stories. I think in this climate, how we've gotten here and the things we've, we've come to realize over the past decade, I, I can't imagine why any non-native director would, uh, would want to do it. I, I'm, I'm actually kind of baffled. Falls Around Her, starring veteran actor Tantu Cardinal, is also in the TIFF lineup this year. Ojibwe filmmaker Darlene Naponce wrote and directed the film in her First Nations community. When an Indigenous filmmaker makes it, especially if it's from their own community, they already have that that full experience of being Indigenous and, and knowing that story. To make the Grizzlies, the director had to earn the trust of the Inuit community. When Miranda first came north to explore the possibility of making this film, my first thought was, who is this white lady? And who the heck is she to be telling this story? I was so inspired by these kids. Miranda Depontier was that white lady. I was an outsider, I'm still an outsider. And so I felt a real responsibility to make sure that we were telling this story respectfully. Depontier teamed up with two Inuit film producers, but says she's not sure she'd direct the Grizzlies today, given what she's learned from indigenous storytellers. I think it's time for, you know, white, <laughs> filmmakers to step aside and I think it's vastly important that we give more opportunities to Indigenous and diverse filmmakers right now. The Poncier now mentors Indigenous creatives with hopes they'll be the ones behind the lens of their own stories going forward. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Earlier this season, our Duncan McHugh sat down with three Indigenous filmmakers to talk about the importance of telling their own stories. Have a listen to a bit of that conversation. Films have been made about Indigenous people for a century now, and uh, when the general public knows so little about our cultures because it hasn't been taught in our education system, we're at a point now that so many films have been made about us without us that they're just telling the same story over and over again. The authorship of cinema is dictated by who the creators are, not who is on screen. And that means that throughout history, 99% of all movies about Indigenous people have not been made by us, and we, we deserve that opportunity as much as anyone else. You can watch Duncan's full national conversation on our YouTube page. Coming up on The National, fighting for equal pay. The split between urban and rural postal workers is also one that is mostly between men and mostly women. We're in such a separation with a group of people that we do the same work with, we do feel very second class in the corporation. Canada Post and the Postal Union spent months trying to figure out what's next after they failed to reach a deal. That's ahead. And a reminder here, you can and you should subscribe to our newsletter. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. It goes deeper on some of the top stories and highlights the stories you might have missed. Subscribe at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Australia's Catholic Church rejected calls today for priests to be compelled to report child abuse revealed in confessionals. The decision comes amid a tough week for the Catholic Church. Pressure is building to make sure abusers are held to account. Just last week, the Pope was met with anger over the issue during a visit to Ireland. The effects of that kind of trauma can ripple far and wide, including family members of the abusers themselves. 
Tonight, our CBC Short Talk introduces you to the daughter of an American Lutheran pastor currently serving a 29-year sentence for child sexual abuse. Her story is about giving a voice to those rarely heard from and asking a pretty difficult question. How do you continue to love someone who has done such terrible things? Here's Between You and Me. People ask me all the time if I've forgiven him. And I don't know how to answer that. But I can say that I love him. And that it's hard to love someone who has done terrible things. But the terrible things don't undo the love. I'm nervous every time. Yeah. I, I, it's been 13 years and I, I, I never, I've never gone and not been nervous. Yeah. What I was thinking about in terms of going in actually is that there's a possibility that something about our outfits might be wrong or like, okay. um, and so I'm hoping that maybe you two can stay in the parking lot yeah. until well, you'll see us go in. All right, here's how this will go. If these pants are the parking lot, then we'll drive into the parking lot and we'll walk up to this building here. Everyone will line up here out in front and we'll go in. Cameras won't be able to come in here. And this is where they'll decide if our outfits are appropriate if we have the documentation we need. And if for whatever reason we don't have it, we'll come back out to the parking lot. But if we go through, then immediately you'll see us come out the side door and walk down a path. And this will be in front of the electric razor wire. My dad's building is over here. And so we'll go in here and then we'll be gone. All we can take in are 10 photos each. And nothing about these is going to get us No. Now. Yeah, you can't have any pictures of alcohol. You can't have any nudity. And due to the nature of my dad's offense, you can't have any like half clothed children. Every two years of my entire life, we went to the same beach. We did the same thing every year. Everything was ritualized. What we ate, where we went, the family photo we took. Uh, this is July through the 12th. It's our ninth year. We walk out in front of that same sign and all assemble in the same way. All the Michael Kors are here. For 35 years. It was Easter, and my mom called, and she was crying, and she told us something really bad had happened. It started out as this hypothetical thing, and then it turned out that he told his bishop, he told his therapist, he told my mom, and he confessed. And then the next thing you know, he was moving across the country to Atlanta and going into this sex offender rehabilitation program. And it all just felt really unbelievable. It was right after the Boston priest trials where Catholic priests had been indicted for molesting altar boys. It became clear that dad was going to be the first religious figure on the West Coast that was going to be prosecuted. The prosecution interviewed over 150 people from all of my dad's congregations over the last 20 years. Someone came and confiscated all of our childhood videos. It was a really scary time. Yeah. 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 
here we have the worried father facing, watching his daughter who just completed swimming lessons. What I really remember of that time is this big witch hunt of trying to find more boys. If there were more boys, there would be a stronger case for a life sentence. Ultimately, they weren't able to find more than one. It was just this one. People ask, you know, how did you start talking about this? And I say, within a month of our dating, mm -hmm. I started dealing with the sexual violence in my life, and Becca's dad went to jail for child sexual abuse. You had begun telling the story about what had happened in your life, and I began to offer these things that were going on currently in mine. The only thing I remember from that conversation is you said it was only a shower. And my response to you was, then in my case, it was only a massage. One of the most striking memories I have of this fractured feeling is at his sentencing. At some point, his lawyer said, can everyone in the room who's here for Michael Score please stand up? Yeah. And three quarters of the room stood up. And I stood up because I was standing up for you because I loved you, and I stared at the mom of the boy who was in, also in the room. In the room. And I just like imagined like, what would it feel like to be that mom who's defending her son, who's a boy, and to feel three quarters of the room endorse this man's character. And it stuck with me in part too because like, I was one of those people standing. I've never made total sense of that instinct to right. stand. And looking around the room and looking at the faces of people who were there to support that family, I felt similarly torn, thinking, like, I also am here to support your family. And many of them were wearing sexual survivorship ribbons. It felt very divided. The room with the people with the ribbons who were there for the kid and the people without the ribbons who were there for my dad. And I really felt this profound sense of, but I also want a ribbon. Like, I'm not pro-sexual violence. I'm not endorsing my father's actions. He's saying he's guilty. Part of me wants to know, you know, do you have desire for adolescent boys? Is that something you feel? But then there's a part of me that's like, I actually don't want to know that. I didn't pick my queerness. Like, what if he, you don't pick your attraction to boy? And I wonder if my orientation was truly oriented towards adolescent boy, like how hard that would be in life. There's no light. There's, yeah, there is. There's no light. It says record. Okay. We are at Alan Sally's motel very patient. with a tornado oh, watch. How it is. And our temperature could range anywhere from 71 in Sault Ste. Marie to 90 in Cincinnati. Where's it coming from? Okay, we have the floor. Oh, 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 I got that one, yeah. Wait a minute. The sign has a fall. We gotta zoom in on this. This is good. This is very good. Oh man, they've broken the sign. Are you seeing this? Sally is dying. Okay. It's hard to love someone who has done terrible things, but the terrible things don't undo the love. To still crave connection, to still want them to participate in my life, to still love him. I don't feel like there's a lot of room in the world to have that conversation. And are you worried that this movie is failing to do that? Yes. Maybe. That was a shortened version of Between You and Me. You can see the full version and the series it's part of, showcasing work from emerging filmmakers online. Just head to cbc.ca slash short docs.
On The National Tonight, Mexico's Navy says it has detained a Canadian man in connection with a massive drug seizure. They reportedly seized 2.2 metric tons of cocaine from a boat off the coast of Oaxaca. Seven other people were also detained. The only land route in and out of Churchill, Manitoba is finally going to be restored. This rail line was damaged by flooding in May 2017 and has been closed ever since. It's meant an increase in food and fuel costs for people living in that northern community. But the federal government announced today the line has been purchased and repairs are set to begin immediately. Criminal charges have been laid against five Quebec teenagers for allegedly sharing sexually explicit images of classmates. The students from a private school were arrested back in May when they were just 12 and 13 years old. Charges include sexual assault, extortion, and possession of child pornography. There's been a settlement in a class action lawsuit over the expiry of Aeroplan Miles. The case took aim at the company's decision in 2006 to cancel members' accounts if there was no activity for 12 months. Under the proposed agreement, a set number of Aeroplan Miles will be deposited into the accounts of eligible members, but it's not clear right now precisely how many. One of Josh Donaldson's most memorable moments. There are reports tonight that the Toronto Blue Jays have traded the third baseman to the Cleveland Indians, though the deal isn't official yet, and it's not clear what Toronto got in return. Donaldson has only played 36 games this season, missing almost 100 due to injury. Canada Post and the union representing thousands of its workers are heading to arbitration. They failed to reach a deal last night, and for workers, it's a disappointing development in a long-standing pay equity dispute. Olivia Stefanovic has that story. For two decades, Nancy Giesen has been driving these rural roads, delivering mail to people in the country and residential areas. She's one of 8,000 rural and suburban letter carriers with Canada Post who are mostly women and earn at least 25% less than their colleagues in the city who are mostly males. We do feel very second class in the corporation. Urban workers receive an hourly rate. Rural and suburban workers' pay is based mainly on the number of delivery stops they make and how far they have to travel using their own vehicles like Parminderjeet Gill. We've been treated, we've been treated not equally. Last spring, an arbitrator found both types of employees did the same job and set a deadline for the two sides to negotiate pay. It's been a long struggle. Frustrating that you're so close. Close, but not quite there yet. A decision couldn't be reached on how much employees should be compensated dating back to 2016 and what the wage will be going forward. Now an arbitrator is preparing to impose a decision. If you can't stay in the black as a business, uh, as a, a providing a service without engaging in forms of discrimination, I think it's time to rethink your business model. The Crown Corporation declined an interview request, but in an email statement sent to CBC News, interim president and CEO Jessica McDonald writes pay equity is a matter of basic human rights and is fundamental to the values of Canada Post. We therefore welcome the upcoming arbitration ruling. In anticipation of a settlement, the Postal Service has built a $242 million loss into its latest quarterly results to cover costs, although that number could be revised depending on the final outcome of arbitration. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Regina. Still ahead, our moment of the day is the moment that British Prime Minister Theresa May is having online. Oh, dear. And it's the second time this week that May has busted a move on camera. The full tape and the best reaction from online and comparisons. That's next on The National. Listen, foreign visits can be tricky things for any leader, but for British Prime Minister Theresa May... Well, they've landed somewhere between a nightclub and a nightmare. Her fancy footwork is tonight's moment. She first cut some rug earlier this week on her African tour with this attempt at dance near Cape Town. 
Dean a few jokes at her expense, but she just couldn't help but double down. Yesterday in Kenya, busting out a new outfit and some new moves. Not sure what you'd call that. The Brexit shuffle, the English channel changer. Anyway, social media has since exploded with a series of hilarious mashups. <laughs> Parents with toddlers will love the baby shark version. Mommy shark, do, 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 do. Mommy shark, do, 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 do. And there's even something for those who love weird old Eurovision songs. <laughs> Such are the perils of international dance diplomacy. So, Rosie, here's where I stand. I, 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 have, I have a little unwritten rule that, that I try to live by, which is not to laugh at anyone else's dancing. Because Lord knows, oh. if I was in that situation, I would not do any better. And, and maybe I would even do worse. So I, I say good on her for trying. I have an unwritten rule not to laugh at politicians in case I want to interview them one day. But there are two rules in politics. You don't eat on camera. And you mm. do not dance. The only politician <laughs> I've seen who can dance, maybe Barack Obama. That's that's, that's the only advice. one who's got a bit of groove. <laughs> <laughs> that's the national for this Friday, August 31st. Thanks for joining us. Have a good weekend and good night. Good night. <laughs> not doing it. Not doing it. <laughs>